Okay. So, hello, Dr. Hello. Michael Pearson, the one and only. Hello, Alison B. Where it all starts. Here. Ah, yes. So, do you want to talk a little bit about this, actually? Like, like go into it a little bit? What I would like oh. to know is, and I've asked you a little bit about this, but what so first of all tell us a little bit about when this kind of gravitational pull towards the humanistic mm. management and getting it out there what happened what happened good question i when i was i think i shared with you the story when when we were sort of at the border of germany i grew up in germany western germany southwest near france and switzerland so actually every morning when i went to school i had to bike through switzerland to get to my school in germany because it was sort of like a it was a mountain and mm -hmm. to get around it we had to go through switzerland so there was a border but it was actually not preventing us from living it was kind of exciting it was kind of interesting <laughs> and then one one at one point we went to visit my grandparents that lived from the maybe 20 miles away from the border to Eastern Germany at the time. And so we go and we visit and we walk through the forest and all of a sudden you see like an opening up and then you see a meadow, fence, and then a tower, tower with people, a watchtower, and they have guns in there. And they aim- How old are you? I, uh, I think I was maybe 10, 11 or something. And I was experiencing that and I was like, that's so weird. That's so weird. And it feels weird that they're putting guns at us, et cetera, et cetera. So <laughs> what is happening here? Of course, I sort of knew that Germany was split into two and that there was a war and all of that. But just that that sensation was, what is this about? Yeah, it is about politics. And yes, it is about now the economic system, how we organize the economic system, communism versus capitalism. You knew that at 10? I got that then at some point sort of that that well I mean the question was sort of like like why is that so I I got that conceptually there is something behind that 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 just didn't add up for me because the other piece that I got from that visit was like I can't run further if I run further I'm dead because of all, all the mines there and, and things like that and as a kid that's not what you think about when you see a meadow so you want to go run right <laughs> so it was all that kind of disruptive um I don't know, background there that I couldn't quite put together. But then in the same time, when I was sort of looking, I was, I grew, I grew up Catholic. I was an altar boy. I was like going to mass regularly. I, I sort of was dedicated uh, in some way to be a good person. <laughs> and, and at the same time, I sort of felt like in my family, business was scorned. People in business were sort of like, that's, that's like not good. Uh, and I was fascinated with with business people. I don't know why. I read uh, stories. I think when I was fourteen. No, no, that's also twelve. Uh, I remember about the richest person in the world. His name was Adnan Khashoggi at the time. And it turned out, well, they were reporting on all the cool things he has and all the gadgets. And so I was like, oh, okay. So only in one sentence did they say where that money came from. It was he was a weapon dealer. Mm. I was like. Hmm, that's so weird. I was fascinated by the story that the a very famous German magazine was putting up on on the richest person. I was looking at that and just felt like this is important. This is a good person, <clears throat> and then a weapon dealer, and I didn't quite get it. And and it's like that seemed to occur quite a lot. And so in our stories, what, what we young, occurred? That yeah, I was fascinated with business, but then at the same time, I was sort of like that can't be true. That's not not that's not good. There is like something in at least in the in a German culture that was about that business people are bad people and that business is bad. And so that was got sort of reaffirmed by some of these stories about the rich people and, and, and things, things like that. At the same time, I did feel there was power to business and I couldn't quite put my hand on it. But then what I what I got um, after I was in the military service and I had sort of to the time to think about what I wanted to do, it's like I was really thinking like, I want to understand <laughs> why we're going into conflict, why there are people uh, behind the wall that have fallen by the time uh, pointing guns at, at me. And that could have been me. <laughs> 
had I been older and grown up in a dif in a different uh, part of of the world. Could have been so, you pointing the gun. Pointing the gun, right? Pointing the gun because um, right. military service or something, and I, I, I that's my station. So, so all of these things were were troubling me to some degree. And, and I was, you're how old now? Now I'm sort of 19, 19. And then I'm I'm figuring out okay what I want to do is what I wanted to do before is I want to understand better what's going on here, and I think that the key to all of this has to do with understanding business and economics, because that's where Marxism comes from, that's where capitalism comes from. This is why the West and the East are sort of bashing each other, or uh, why why somehow conflict persists to some degree. And so I wanted to understand it, wanted to learn about it, but then when I was at university, I I felt like that was the most frustrating experience because those were the questions that weren't asked. <laughs> so they were not answered either. It was just like, here is here is a book, read it by heart, and then then here is what what you need to do in the exam. So there was not much of that conversation around the bigger picture, con picture bigger pictures. Do you have any yes. idea why, maybe? Do you have any idea why the question wasn't those questions weren't being asked yeah i i mean it's i don't know i don't know because much of what it, what turns out business education is 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 a preparation for a job in an industry and that doesn't necessarily or most of the time include a bigger general culture education right and so it's very functional if you are doing business and you learn about finance, then you learn about marketing, then you learn about um, logistics. And all of those are important things to get a job, but they don't help you answer the bigger questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so I, was, I was in that space, I was stumped and I was very unsatisfied with what was happening there. And I read then started reading myself. And I was lucky that I got into a, a joint degree program with a political science school in France. And that's where many of those topics were debated, at least <clears throat> were, were addressed. And some of the thinking happened that I, I missed. Some of the but, questions were being asked. So yeah, the various system questions, political questions, like what and where conflict is from and how you, how you, <laughs> how you address these issues. What are different economic systems? Why do we think a certain way? Uh, and yeah, what what is the what is the genes genesis here? Why did we come up with those ideas and that way of thinking? And then when I got all of that, I felt like, well, that's okay, and I get it, but it's pretty stupid. Not like totally stupid, but many of the basic assumptions that we're making were factually wrong, were easy to disprove, and we sort of still buy it as a. What society. were some of those assumptions? Well, the question of who we are as human beings, that we are greedy bastards, or the basic assumptions of economics that we that there is not enough. And we will never have enough, that we will never have enough, and that the, the resources are scarce. So those are pl plausible assumptions for some part, but if your whole system, your whole thinking is generated around those assumptions, even though you don't know it, then you have a scarcity mindset, then you have a mindset that you are not enough, you want more, 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 more and that your happiness is generated by being more. Okay, so you're 10, you see mm -hmm. the parents pointed at you. For about nine years, you're asking questions. You mm -hmm. go to France for your program and some of the questions are being asked and you're hearing the answers and saying, bullshit, that's not, the case right if i'm hearing correctly yeah, well, it's, it's not very very gratifying or satisfying or sophisticated thinking so because what was being taught and uh preached in a way was at our core what that we are in in the system of capitalism we are seen as greedy that greed is good. That's the that's the famous line of the movie that sort of basically capture captures what we're teaching and how we have built up society around it in the Western domain for that time. In the Eastern domain, it was we were fundamentally social and we all want to contribute to the common good. And that in itself wasn't accurate either. So the question is really like, who, what is the answer, the fundamental answer to who we are as human beings and what do we know? And that's what happened when you were sitting there. And that was just like, yeah, what, what are the, why are we, why are we talking about this? Why do we, why did we decide that that 
that goal of organizations is profit maximization. And okay. and if so that then is, what what happened? What happened was like a continuous frustration that there was there's so many smart people apparently, and then such basic basic questions aren't really fundamentally answered and uh, not even taken seriously. And so it's it was actually very disempowering to sit there and just hear and the, the way that pedagogy works in such a universities, you as a student can't ask questions oftentimes either because you're too many and or because the the professor just lectures. Right. And um, so yeah, in that context that that was just very unsatisfying. And these these questions I got to understand them later when I was going to business when I was starting my own companies, when I when I just had this fundamental dysfun uh, uh, dissatisfaction that I don't think I am either. <laughs> right. I'm not a greedy bastard. I'm a good person. And I do want to be wealthy in a sense. I want to be right. prosperous. It's not like I don't want to, I, I want to suffer. Uh, so did you bring that to your next step? Well, yeah, that was sort of the ongoing kind of kind of mirroring is like, where and how do I find it that there is a satisfactory explanation of who I am and who we are as people so that we can then build collaboration or other pieces around it. I mean, it was very obvious in the 90s already that the environmental crisis will be very significant. And that part of the reasons of that is that we think of ourselves as never having enough and that we are greedy. And so we can't we we're not we're doomed we're basically not fit for survival because what we do is damaging our earth our home our habitat and apparently we're destined to do so just made no sense makes no sense and that is still the gospel coming from where like how do you explain that place of where it makes no sense i know what you're talking about mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how can how can we put it into words uh because I understand that, wait, wait, this makes no sense. Mm -hmm. But why? Why didn't it make sense? Well, because part of it was accurate. Uh, and I, I, what I will say is what didn't make sense was the equation. We are greedy bastards. To be happy, quote unquote, we need more. So the more that my life experience wasn't fitting that, <laughs> and it wasn't totally opposite either. It was like, hmm, part of it is true, but there, there's much more, there's much more. And I know that that's the case. And I know that my friends and, and my people around me that I grew up know that too. And our cohort just cannot identify. I could not identify with this. And so that didn't make sense. That didn't make sense that that was then the foundation of how we organize society. That means the economic system is the one that we're establishing to fulfill these material needs. And apparently we don't have, we never have enough. So we need more growth, more growth, more growth. And any kind of government that's successful is successful when it creates economic growth. That's the kind of equation. And, um, I guess very early in my career, I was exposed to Aristotle who said, the point of economy, uh, economic system is to create happiness or well-being of people. And I said like, I don't think people are happy. I'm not super happy. <laughs> so all of that just didn't make any sense. And then it's like, oh, okay, if the original term economics comes from household, managing the household so that people are happy and flourish, then we're doing a crap job. We're not doing a totally poor job, but certainly there must be better. And um, yeah, so what didn't make sense was that we had this assumption and then the, the, the climate change crisis, the environmental crisis, all of those came into play where it's like, it's obvious that we're taking too much, that we're, <laughs> that we're destroying too much, that we're taking, making and wasting to fulfill some fleeting desire that ultimately makes us miserable. And that's where I think the other conversation comes in. The misery, desperation, the anxiety, the uh, depression rates have all gone up since. And while people may not be fully aware, I would say that is because we all know this system doesn't make any sense. This setup 
isn't really allowing us to flourish. We have to fit in a system that doesn't jibe with the fundamental true human nature. Right. I, ca I call that when I'm misaligned and I yeah. don't sometimes even know how to put it to words. I'm just misaligned with something coming at me. It's just, I'm, I'm, and I'm, tr I'm usually misaligned when I'm trying to fit a mold desperately mm -hmm. that society or family or someone says I'm supposed to fit and I'm just hitting a wall. So what you were misaligned uh, along with others. And then, so what did you, did you, did you decide to search deeper into that and yeah. write a book, study courses? I'd love to hear like mm. what the trajectory was of, you know, where you are now, which is Dr. Michael Pearson, author, I mean, mm. scholar, it's incredible. And so I would <laughs> love to know, no, it is. And, and, and we're all benefiting from it and so i would love to just know like what that trajectory was okay you're sitting there and misaligned this is not true right right and what what happened what happened is like i did i felt alone i felt isolated i felt stupid because mm -hmm. i thought i was the only one that 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 is sort of in that experience at least in the cohort that i was studying economics finance in business with, um, not with my prior cohort, which with 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 which I sort of grew up and and graduated. So I say like either my experience was very unique and special, or or I'm sort of weird, and all of that. And I think those are very very typical reactions at that time when you find quote unquote yourself or you're like in the space of misalignment. And, and then what I did is like, I, I wanted to know more. I wanted to know more because I felt like can't be true that I'm so off because <laughs> I see all these other things and they just don't add up as a pattern. And so the more that I studied, the more that I then also decided I'll take on whatever there is to take on in this business world. Even if I'm misaligned, I'm sort of taking it on as an experience to then more credibly say this or that can be improved. Right. So I was very clear that I wanted to be a change maker, so to speak, in terms of understanding what's happening, because I seem to be one of the few people that was thinking about that. So at some point I, I got people were telling me, like, well, maybe that's your task. That's your calling. That's your that's what you can contribute. And I wasn't thinking I would be an entrepreneur in a sense. I actually was afraid of of being an entrepreneur. But now I do think what I've become is like an intellectual entrepreneur in a sense that I'm creating newly <clears throat> patterns and, and stories that potentially can help those that are similarly misaligned and feel similarly misaligned uh, to, to generate a, a narrative and a pattern that can provide them access to their own power, their hope, their, their way of being that actually fits with their true, authentic, <laughs> deepest desires uh, in a way that they can live a fulfilling life. Um, which is much bigger than the economic question. It's much big, bigger than business, but it is what what I think is the fundamental, yeah, human human endeavor. So that's that's what got me excited. That's what got me going. That's what what I'm excited about. That's what sort of shaped my potential contribution once I got that. That that is, while maybe a minority, it's still a sizable minority. <laughs> that, that uh that it isn't yeah that that michael pearson is not the only one but that there is actually yeah from my parents on to my friends that i grew up with to other people that i met in a space there was this acute kind of pain that this can be better this this must be better or everybody's sort of saying i give up i'm desperate and i'm gonna try to just get drunk when I can <laughs> and, and fit and fit uh, and make it fit for myself. And so that kind of quiet desperation there um, pointed to me that there must be something better because that's, that's not where, where we thrive. And, and ultimately I, I noticed that many people are searching for a much bigger contribution for much deeper connection with each other for wealth and, and prosperity in a sense that they don't have to suffer. But that wasn't the ultimate goal 
uh, and being number one wasn't the ultimate goal for most people. Do you feel you found it? I found for me patterns and stories that empower me. Yes, that empower me. I'm not saying that those are the only ones, but I'm I'm what, in a much what are, better. What could you share some of those? Well, as I, as we talked about in the book, I'm writing about whereas like I start with the example of three people that sort of felt this misalignment. <laughs> some earlier, they're still in that job and they hate their job, but mm -hmm. they right. they the beginning they, of the book right. Then uh, they, there are people that are more senior, have had very successful careers on the outside, very wealthy, but saying, this is, I'm, I'm not gonna be at Wall Street. I'm gonna dedicate myself to bigger, bigger things and thoughts. So there, this is how the book opens. And what I found is that the, even though it may not be a lived experience of a majority, the desire of a majority is that they are aligning themselves with, others and with the world at large and the model that i found that explains this rather well is this four drive model in which we have multiple drives that are independent of each other but that we all need to satisfy to be flourishing and surviving and so the the aha moment i had when i was uh, actually i was i remember i was on a train from boston to new york and I had a manuscript from a colleague of mine, well, a colleague of mine, a senior mentor of mine, Paul Lawrence at Harvard Business School, who had written about the same kind of issues, in a sense, um, from an evolutionary perspective and had scanned all the evolutionary biology and anthropology insights to, to understand who we are as human beings. And, and he came up with this model. And that just like, when I saw that, I was like, wow, this gives, this gives me access to understanding myself <laughs> and the model understanding others drives. yes it is basically that yes we do want prosperity we want to acquire things otherwise we would not survive and we want to defend it we need to defend it otherwise we would also be dead so let's but go that, through them slowly so mm -hmm. the four draws so, so you're on the train uh he he Paul Lawrence brought up, uh, had written about these four drives and that yes. resonated with you? That and resonated with me as a, as a way to, under, to understand this question that I'm mentioning to you now that was sort of always lingering in the background. It's like, which is? Which is who are we? Who are we? How can we explain why we are here and, 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 and what is the good life, so to speak, right? What does it so mean? So go ahead, explain how. Yeah. Explain it so, in detail. Those in very, times. in very, in very basic scientific terms, is we have survived because we are a species that is, yeah, acquiring what it needs to 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 stay alive, to defend what it needs, but also to collaborate with others, to be tribal, to be social, to connect with others at a deep level, to solve the problems of survival together that's why we have cities communities and all of these kind of things we're a, a hyper social a youth social species and we oftentimes deny that uh, in the in the stories of our individualism etc cetera, etc cetera, culturally plus we have to in order to survive we have developed a brain that can do abstract thinking but with abstract thinking we can solve problems that weren't there before so we can transcend routine and routine problems by asking the question why did it happen how can we come up with a solution and then together with others create a solution and um, this is the drive to bond and the drive to comprehend that makes us fundamentally human so let's and say let's go First drive to acquire, you, drive to acquire. I want to get you doing it. So uh, okay, okay. So the first drive is the drive to acquire that came along with the drive to defend because we needed to be able to defend what we acquired to be able to survive. So well, we share that drive with let's all. Let's do this. Let's do this to cut because I have I have a vision of you. Okay, good, good, so, good. so if we could get your your lovely beautiful face going, what the four drives are: drive to acquire, drive to bond, blah blah blah. So let's do that. Then I'll say to you. Okay, now let's slowly go through them. So go ahead, right there. Go, 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 go. The drive to acquire, the drive to defend, the drive to bond, and the drive to comprehend. Those four drives. Okay, can you explain to us each one? Explain to me so it gets in here. Got it. Yeah, so the drive to acquire is the drive to satisfy what we need materially, wealth-wise, status-wise, to survive. The food, 
the sex, the pizza, the, the, the procreation pieces that we need to be able to survive and procreate, right? That we also need to be able to defend. So the drive to defend is if somebody takes our stuff or if a tiger comes or some animal comes, we're able to protect ourselves somehow, right? So otherwise we would not be, be able to be here. But defense is different from acquisition, right? Separate thing. In our brain, it's the fight and flight instinct that sort of showcases that we're able to, to do this instinctually. And that is critical to our survival. The drive to bond is what came actually when we transitioned from Homo habilis to Homo erectus. Um, so they argue that that is when we became a social being. That's when we formed tribes, communities, when our children needed nuclear families to be able to survive because they needed the protection of mother and father and division of labor and tribes would help the offspring grow faster. We had a brain uh, uh, growth happen in that time that would help us process emotions and social relations. And so that is the drive to bond. We fundamentally are a social species, which we can understand when we know how we punish ourselves the most. We punish ourselves most when we are putting each other into isolation, mm -hmm. ban people, uh, bully people, <laughs> put them in the uh, isolation uh, cell in a prison, right? So that's when our mind actually goes crazy. And when many people also then commit suicide or something like that, so they're not able to survive well in isolation. The fourth drive, the drive to comprehend, is that which makes us homo sapiens, sapiens, the knowing, the person that uses knowledge and abstract thinking to solve problems. And that is when we ask the question, why we are here? <laughs> uh, why is uh, the tree falling here? Why uh, uh, are people surviving over there better? So we are able to understand our context, our environment, and then figure out how we can solve those problems. Not always successfully in our lifetime, but over time, our species has been able to create solutions to the survival questions there. And at the same time, those ab abstract thinking skills require us to have a purpose in life, something, some narrative, something bigger, some creation narrative that's where others are saying, when we came, became homo sapiens, we became a religious or spiritual species that is searching for the answers why we are here. And the whole theoretical framework that Paul was presenting is these four drives are independent of each other. And we are able to survive best when we are balancing them, not when we maximize one. Mm -hmm. And when we maximize one or either either any of those, then we're typically not in a space where we can survive well. So too much wealth, too much status, too much acquisition is not necessarily helpful. It can be like a disease, right? Too much um, comprehension, becoming an ideologue or some kind of truth warrior of some sort. Oftentimes, yeah, you have suicide bombers that are basically taking themselves out of the gene pool because they wanna maximize their alignment with ideology. Uh, bonding, yeah, you have the tribal maximizers like the Nazis or any of the nationalist or other types of cults potentially that, that are sort of focusing on you being part of the community, oftentimes suppressing everything else. And oftentimes in that sense, also creating a lot of conflict as a result where typically people die, war, etc, etc. So those are basically dysfunctional maximization strategies that over time, if you can look at history, you can see manifested in how our species has survived or not survived. And balancing, therefore, is the key. And that's where Paul was saying that's the prefrontal cortex, that's the latest addition to our brain, helps us to balance these four drives in a in a way that typically allows us to survive. Um, so that made of this, sense to you? That was your aha? That made totally sense to me in a sense that, that yes, I get it. Yes, I want to be a social being. I don't want to be an individualist maximizer of my own utility, which is the other model, which is the foundation of the model for which we have created a capitalist economic system. 
uh, where shareholder value maximization is is the most important for the organization gdp maximization is the most important for the nation and individual income maximization is the most important of quote unquote indicator <laughs> for whether society or you are successful in society and now that's crude to some degree, but certainly that is a majority sort of uh, narrative that that underpins much of our culture. And so that uh, didn't make sense when I saw what Paul was writing. It's like, oh, OK, now I get it. Now I get a lot more about myself and I get a lot more about organizations that actually work. Uh, so that's, cannot... that's an interesting fact, though, because a lot of people, me, I, you know, mm. I, I would probably first think in terms of the self-centeredness of it like me 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 oh that makes sense for me and i'll balance mm. before drive. but you had the you had the wherewithal i mean it, it was also your vocation business and so forth but you had the wherewithal to know okay that makes sense for me as the individual mm. but now i can bring it out to business as well yeah so my question was always like which which organizations work better like in in where would, would i want to thrive where do i want to work i was in a consulting company and in other places in in and like bureaucracies large actually very blingy names uh, oftentimes and then i felt like this is not where i want to be this makes no sense i don't want to be living like that and um yeah, and I what saw that. What did you to the next step? Was it that train ride, or is that where kind of the you went from point A to point B in this quest? That was certainly sort of a, a major incision point where I said, "Ah, oh, okay, there is a on top of my philosophical, theological, sociological, humanities-based training. Now I got sort of the science, natural science piece that oftentimes is used as a counter when you say." well, we're good and blah, blah, blah. And there's like, no, where's the evidence? So here we had evidence from a much harder core science than, than what economics is. And economics is basically a sham science that rests mathematical assumptions on other assumptions about human nature and then calls it scientific. And these four drives were based on evolution. The right, right. And so, so that gave me access to an explanatory model that I needed <laughs> to be able to see what else can we do better. I was in the space of working with companies and social enterprises and, and social entrepreneurs in places where it's like, okay, there are people out there that want to make a positive difference in the world. And they do this not following and actually countering the the traditional model the the typical dominant narrative about who we are you drive right yeah. mm -hmm. and, and so yeah and so that's where i was attracted and i said oh my god that's a possibility so that's cool so that made me that enlightenment gave me enlightenment that was like ah i i i am not wrong i can do stuff and with that it, with that sort of mental model i felt much more in charge mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I empowered, could do sure. research, empowered, I can do, I can explain things for people, help them understand things differently through this, I can teach that way, I can create my own organizations that way, I can, I can support others in a way, and I, I can write about it, and all these things, like, wow, that's, that's just, that's a powerful self-serving, but also other-serving <laughs> um, piece that I, that I felt that I got that, that really, gave me access to something. Now, it's still a small contribution in a sense of what I think is important or necessary to shift in the world. Um, and yeah, but that's, that's sort of- What would you like to see, Dr. Michael Pearson? What would you like to see? What I'd like to see is, yeah, that we are shifting the narrative, the story of who we are as people in society and that create organizations around that where we can uh, create benefit for all, not denying benefit to us, sort of uh, transcending this false dichotomy between I and you and others, but that we are part of the same kind of family. So what's good for me typically can be, well, what's good for others can be good for me and what good, what's good for me can be good for others. Now, is that something that, that, that is a natural? I'd say that's where education comes in. Do we know Amran? 
Mm -mm. We don't? No. Imran? Hello? Yeah, I can hear him. Yeah. Yes. Are you, for what are you Hello. here? Do you have another session? No, this session is this session now. Uh, I, were you here for the uh, Community Connect yesterday? Sorry? What are you, uh, you you're, you're looking for and you're looking for a, a session now? Yes. Which one? Mm, wait. International Leadership Association. Mm. 